Hello and welcome to today's special webinar, The ROI Story, Evaluating and Justifying Disruptive Technology. Today's event is brought to you by Nutanix and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis. I'm a partner at Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's event. And what that means is that I have the honor of introducing Mr. Steve Kaplan, someone I've known for many years now. He's the Vice President of Customer Success in Finance at Nutanix. Steve is well known in the industry, and he goes by ROI Dude on Twitter. Now, before I hand it over to Steve, I should mention that we want this to be a very educational event, so we encourage your questions. Feel free to use the questions box there in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. We also have a $300 Tango gift card to give out to one lucky attendee on the live event. Full price terms and conditions can be found at events.actualtechmedia.com. And I want to call your attention to one more thing that is in the audience console right there. You can download Steve's new book, The ROI Story, in PDF form. So make sure you get your copy today because it has just been released. And with that, let's kick it off. Take it away, Steve. Thank you, David. And welcome, everybody, to The ROI Story, Evaluating and Justifying Disruptive Technology. Uh, as David said, my name is Steve Kaplan. Uh, Vice President of Customer Success Finance and Nutanix, a better known as at ROI Dude on Twitter. The vicious, what I refer to as the vicious cycle of technology in, in data center really got going in November of 2003. That's when VMware introduced the world to vMotion. Now, if you weren't in IT in those days, it's really kind of hard to grasp just how magical the emotion was. Uh, many IT people still remember exactly what they were doing the first time they saw the emotion. In my case, I was uh, with a friend of mine who had, uh, you know, introduced me to the product, and, and I was absolutely captivated. In fact, on the spot, we decided to launch a channel partner business focused around uh, VMware virtualization. The Virtual Center 1.0 users manual that, that spoke about uh, vMotion included four requirements. And the first of those four requirements was the host must share a storage area network, or SAN. Up until that point, SANs had not really penetrated the enterprise too much. The big SAN buyers were what was known then as the internet companies, uh, Alta Vista. Uh, Yahoo was the largest NetApp uh, customer in the world. But in the enterprise, the SANs were struggling. In fact, uh, NetApp and EMC sales, the two leading SAN manufacturers, had, had been declining for three years prior to the release of, of vMotion. And because SANs were then, as they are today, complex, uh, they don't scale very well. Uh, when they reach the end of their a useful life, three or four or five years, or when they reach capacity, customers have to undergo a very complex and time-consuming and, and even potentially risky uh, forklift upgrade. Uh, SANs are not natively resilient. They require uh, that you buy an entire separate storage fabric, a storage network to connect the, the SANs to the servers, and that itself must be maintained and, and managed and if you're running fiber channel, then you have to get fiber channel switches and you, you have to zone those. Uh, SANs are difficult to deploy. They're, they're hard to, to manage. But despite all these challenges, organizations around the globe began buying SANs in massive quantities in order to run uh, VM or vMotion. Now, all this complexity actually worked to the favor of the channel partners back then because they were able to specialize in a particular manufacturer's storage products and then provide professional services to their customers at about twice the margins that they typically would make on, on hardware and software biz. So they would recommend, of course, that SANS that manufacturers products to their customers. And the customers, a, a new breed of storage administrators, also benefited from all this complexity because they could develop a, a deep expertise in the particular SAN uh, that they were using and in some cases kind of get this 
status, almost uh, equivalent to a, an Oracle DBA. And so they, in turn, would recommend to their company that they buy more of this manufacturer's product, and the vicious uh, cycle of complexity would be perpetuated. And what happened was is that just a handful of storage manufacturers emerged uh, as multi-billion dollar annual providers of, of SANS and storage products. And, and they were able to use their kind of oligopoly positions to acquire or outright crush innovative storage startups like uh, Fusion IO and, and Violin Memory and Nimble Storage and, and Tintry and so on. I mentioned that I had uh, started a VMware consultancy. Uh, prior to that, I had started and ran and sold a Citrix consultancy. And in fact, uh, we were named the first Citrix Partner of the Year. And along the way, I authored, co-authored five books, 11 total editions on Citrix and VMware technologies. Co-author being the operative word, I had very brilliant co-authors uh, writing the hard parts, I wrote the, the much easier uh, business parts. And, and when I was a channel partner, you know, we didn't really do conventional selling. I had my MBA and I, I drew on that finance background and we always used ROI analysis and TCO analysis to help our customers evaluate the different alternatives, especially the disruptive Citrix and VMware technologies uh, from a financial framework and, and, and we found that to be uh, very successful. And after I sold my VMware consultancy, I moved up to Lake Tahoe uh, with dreams of kind of doing a, a cushy consulting career. But not long after I moved up, I was approached by this tiny startup. The CEO and the VP of sales talked to me about potentially working there. And they showed me their software defined storage technology, which later became known as hyperconverged, and, and I was blown away. And I, I thought to myself, you know, if this stuff worked, it would change the entire industry. But then I foolishly thought, how often does a 50-person company have a prayer against the handful of multi-billion dollar behemoths that have dominated the data center for years? Uh, so I, I didn't join. But I watched Nutanix over the next year when finally it even got through to me that, you know, these guys were going to do it. And so uh, I gave up my dreams of, of a cushy consulting career. I went back to work 70 hours a week at a startup uh, a little over seven years ago. Uh, but, you know, it's just been an extraordinary opportunity to participate. And as Nutanix has indeed unquestionably changed the industry, and how Nutanix itself is now over a billion dollar uh, uh, company. And uh, at Nutanix, I do the same thing, uh, ROI and TCL consulting, except I have a team of analysts across the globe uh, uh, who uh, also do it. And, and we work with customers to help them evaluate from, with a financial framework all kinds of, of different uh, situations. You know, we compare Nutanix Enterprise Cloud versus status quo, uh, public cloud, uh, other hyper-converged. We look at different use cases. We look at going from physical to virtual uh, database optimization and so on. About a year and a half ago, I thought, you know, I have 25 years of, of evaluating disruptive technology and how to go about it. I should write a book about it. And this one would be all on my own. And so I did. Uh, but uh, it really came out as this great, big, boring white paper. And uh, as I was hiking the Tahoe trails one evening, I kind of had this epiphany that a, that a good financial analysis should tell a story and that the book should do the same. So I completely rewrote the book, and it's called The ROI Story, A, a Guide for IT Leaders. Uh, Mark Templeton, the, the longtime famous CEO of Citrix, graciously wrote the forward. And the book is targeted toward IT leaders, IT staff, CIOs, CFOs, channel partners, consultants, analysts, really anybody who's interested in evaluating, quantifying, and most importantly, justifying a disruptive technology. Because, you know, it's hard to beat the status quo, even if you have really great numbers. A lot of times people, you know, we, people 
want their thirst for um, conflict and, and for drama uh, appealed to. They, they want their emotions appealed to uh, in order to, to move forward with a disruptive solution. And, and chapter two in the book is called The Broken Hardware Defined Data Center. That's why uh, status quo needs disrupting. And, and, and some people may disagree with it, but, but I can talk to a lot of examples about it uh, that, 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 that justify it. T take, for example, shadow IT. I mean, it's a really bizarre concept when you think about it. There's no such thing as shadow legal or shadow human resources. Once in a while, you come across shadow accounting but then it's called fraud. Uh, you know, one of the guys on, on my staff, one of the uh, business analysts, we'll call him Pete, uh, to disguise the, the company, but he used to work for, uh, he used to manage the 800 person infrastructure IT department for a large global enterprise. And one day he gets his phone call from the SAM manufacturer. And the SAM manufacturer said, where do you want the new array? And, and Pete says, well, what new array? Uh, where just find the storage? And after doing some investigating, he learned that the marketing department had surreptitiously set up their own 150-person IT department. And, and while this might be a particularly egregious example of shadow IT, it's far and away from unique. Uh, you know, large enterprises running traditional IT departments everywhere, uh, shadow IT is, is very common because the typical IT staff in, in a legacy environment spends around 70% of their time just keeping the lights on. And the businesses, you know, they feel like they can't afford to wait for IT to respond to their needs. So they, they take it upon themselves uh, to get into their IT, but they, they do it without the efficiencies that accrue from a centralized IT organization, uh, without the government over, the governance oversight, uh, lacking perhaps standards and, and even patching and, and basic security uh, precautions. Uh, you know, the, when it comes to hardware-defined, broken legacy data center, I really love this tweet by Mustafa Kali uh, to, to kind of viscerally make an impact. Uh, Mustafa co-authored the or, or, or authored the book Storage Design and Implementation in vSphere 6. And he bragged on Twitter that he was able to fit all 1,242 pages into one book. I mean, 1,242 pages. This is a, is a big book. Uh, once in a while, I'll lug it with me in my suitcase when I do presentations as a prop. Um, and I've been stopped by TSA who, you know, didn't believe that a book would be that big sitting in my suitcase. Now, in comparison, or in contrast, the Nutanix equivalent to storage design and implementation and in vSphere is a 12-page tech note. So the 1,230-page delta represents not just this massive complexity and all the costs associated with that complexity, but also a rigidity and inflexibility and inability for IT to rapidly deliver the innovative new services and offerings that their customers, their business, is demanding for their customers. And, and this is the big reason why so many organizations are turning to software-defined alternatives like hyper-converged infrastructure and, 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 of course, most commonly, public cloud. And it's easy to imagine a board of director who maybe uh, knows little or nothing of IT uh, and doesn't understand governance or, or security or interoperability, but he sees a sign at the airport uh, about public cloud, or he talks to a buddy, and so he, he goes up to the 20-year veteran CIO, and he tells her, hey, we need to move and shift everything over to public cloud. I mean, nobody else in, in a typical organization, you know, ha you know manufacturing or um, you know, finance, other departments, they don't have to deal with this type of thing like they, they do in IT. And in my travels across the globe, I talk with a lot of prospects and customers who kind of proudly proclaim we have a cloud first strategy. And being an analyst, you know, I ask them why. <laughs> and, and a lot of times that, that they, they have to pause and think about that. And sometimes they, they say, I really don't know. Uh, and sometimes they'll say, well, everybody's doing it. Or they'll say the board told us to, or the CEO told us to. Once in a while I'll hear something like we want 
more agility. We want to be able to get faster time to market. I mean, absolutely great reasons to go to cloud, whether that's public or on-premises. But by far and away, the most common response I get is, we want to save money. And then I'll say, really, would you mind sharing your analysis with me? And nobody ever has, because you don't go to public cloud to save money, at least not for predictable workloads, which will make up the majority of workloads for most organizations. Now, if you're running elastic, burstable workloads, absolutely, they make great economic sense to put in the public cloud. It's kind of like renting or buying a car if you're not going to use it a lot. Put it in the public cloud. If you're going to use it all the time, it's less expensive to buy the infrastructure on-prem. Uh, IDC surveyed 400 uh, organizations last year that were running in public cloud. Uh, and they found that 80% of them had repatriated one or more applications from public cloud back on-prem. And IDC projected that 50% of all applications would be repatriated over the next couple of years. Uh, Tim McCallum on my team is the director of uh, Customer Success Finance at Nutanix. And he was speaking with the chief cloud officer, I uh, will call him George, uh, of the largest real estate company in Australia, a thousand properties across 11 different countries. And they were an example of a cloud first company. Uh, in their case, it was AWS. And Tim was talking to George and George said, hey, hey Tim, I get all you know what you're saying about um, Nutanix bringing public cloud simplicity and resiliency to my on-prem data center. Sounds great, but you know we're just gonna stick with AWS because it's really cheap. And uh, Tim said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that because we do a lot of analyses uh, and, and we find that typically customers can run their applications on-prem on Nutanix for about one half to one third of the cost as in public cloud. And if you're open to it, I'd like to do an analysis for you uh, using your own numbers. And so George said, uh, yeah, well, sure. You know, um, in fact, we're moving 34 more workloads over to AWS. I'll give you the same RV tools output I just sent to them so that they could size it and price it so that you can do the same, uh, but don't get your hopes up. So several days later, Tim came back with a comprehensive TCO analysis comparing, uh, he had mapped all those 34 workloads in AWS and compared the five-year cost uh, of on-prem versus uh, AWS. And this is the summary slide. And, he said to uh, George, you know, as you can see, the projected cost of running those 34 apps on AWS over the next five years is 1.35 million versus $360,000 on Nutanix, a 73% savings. So uh, six weeks later, uh, George and, and the real estate company are a Nutanix customer. In addition to high cost of public cloud, they're also unpredictable cost. I like this tweet by cloud economist Corey Quinn where he makes the analogy of public cloud to medical billing that you know the only time you know what's going to cost you is after the procedure when it's too late and you're already on the hook for it. And you know you occasionally see articles like this uh, in in the regular media or social media. And there's lots of other public cloud factors to consider too ranging you know, from do you really want to go into a total OPEX model? Uh, um, and, uh, you know, do you have the right IT staff capabilities or do you need to hire new people and train new people? And how long is the transition period going to take and so on? And, and in the book, again, I talk about a lot of these considerations. Um, instead of jumping all into public cloud, most organizations were finding uh, optimally do well with a, a multi cloud strategy. One of the, the, the great things of public cloud, though, is, is that it's been the primary cause of breaking the vicious cycle of complexity, the stronghold that the data center oligopolists have had for uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, but I think that Nutanix itself has also uh, helped with breaking that, that vicious cycle. Uh, when, when I joined Nutanix, all the data center leaders scoffed at this notion of hyper-converged 
infrastructure ever running any serious workloads in the, in the data center. But today, every leading data center manufacturer, even, even Cisco, which wasn't traditional storage, all have one or more hyper-converged solution offerings. You know, in, in 2017, uh, the VMware CEO, Pat Gelsinger at uh, VMworld, said that all infrastructure will become hyper-converged. And of course, VMware, uh, even back then, was primarily owned by EMC, the leading storage manufacturer, which today is, is owned by Dell. Uh, IDC, the last couple of quarterly market share reports show that HCI, hyper-converged infrastructure, has rocketed past uh, converged infrastructure, which was the former uh, darling of, of legacy storage for, for years. Uh, Gartner, a few years ago, came out with their HCI Magic Quadrant, and, and they don't even have their Magic Quadrant anymore that features converged infrastructure. So I think it's safe to say, uh, at least in my mind, that HCI is the new uh, data center standard. And, and, you know, both HCI, at least HCI done right, and public cloud are software defined. And they're really two sides of the same coin. Uh, Nutanix, who introduced the world to HCI, our, our roots go back to uh, Google. Uh, the, ch the chief uh, scientist was one of the, uh, uh, Google was one of the, the co-founders of Nutanix, and, and Google developed the Google File System, which uh, the same type of architecture was was uh, adopted by all the leading cloud providers, even Yahoo, uh, for their main hosting business of, of using this concept of a distributed file system uh, across uh, commodity servers, aggregating the local storage. But that you know that changes everything. And what Nutanix did is bring this concept to the enterprise. Now, you know, I always advocate everybody do an analysis, a financial analysis, do an ROI or TCO for really any type of significant IT purchase decision. But it's absolutely crucial when it comes to evaluating disruptive infrastructure because of the difficulty of, of, of fighting back, or not fighting back, but the difficulty of overcoming status quo perceptions and perhaps also of overcoming you know, public cloud hype without uh, any real uh, analysis outlining the advantages of, of and, and the pros and cons of each solution. So you know, the reason to look at, at doing a financial analysis is number one, you want, you want to make sure that you make the optimal purchase decision for your organization, whatever that is. Uh, you want to achieve project funding and reduce the risk to the decision maker because now you've engaged in this analysis and carefully evaluated all the different alternatives. We want to use the financial analysis to ensure that we shift the perspective from short-term tactical, you know, one of our SANS is up for refresh, what should we replace it with, to big picture, long-term strategic. Given the increasing advent of digital transformation and the competition we're seeing in our industry, what is our business even likely to look like in five years and how does IT need to evolve to best support the business? And now we can use financial analysis to help prepare that roadmap. And just going through the process of doing a comprehensive ROI or TCO analysis is going to help ensure project success. And it provides a baseline against which IT can measure that success so that you know, the, the uh, CIO can go to the senior management uh, after the initial project or projects and and, and show them, look, this, the, the, we're right on track to achieve these projected savings along with all these other business benefits. And that way, get more money for IT, for more projects, more promotions, and so on. It, it, it's very important to use uh, financial analysis for disruptive infrastructure because IT shops oftentimes look at uh, infrastructure through what they're commonly used to looking at it through a, a three-tier lens, uh, I call it. Um, and, and so, you know, we'll hear sometimes questions like, uh, what is Nutanix, what is your cost per gigabyte? Because that's how we evaluate storage. And if you understand software-defined infrastructure, you know, you realize just how nonsensical a question like that is. Um, 
so people don't know what they don't know. A financial analysis can help lay everything out and, and, and help educate the customer, the procurement people, the decision makers about what this new technology really is and, and how it's different from what they're used to. Legacy IT budgeting can be on its own an impediment to a disruptive infrastructure and, and to overemphasizing status quo. Many organizations, for example, have buckets of, of budget for compute in one bucket and for storage in the other, which works great in a legacy hardware-defined world, but makes no sense in a software-defined hyper-converged world. Uh, but when you do a, a, a TCO ROI analysis, it kind of helps smooth out these financial timing discrepancies because you look at over a number of years. So again, allowing the optimal decision to be made. Uh, a lot of times people have a, a policy, a lot of organizations like use it or lose it. Well, that's going to kind of auger towards status quo on its own. Or, you know, in finance, one of the first principles you learn is to don't worry about sunk costs. That, that money's already left the company when evaluating uh, different purchase decisions. But it's a kind of an emotional thing we find. People, if they don't put the time and effort into a financial analysis and evaluating it, they just kind of intuitively feel, well, gosh, I got two years left in my sand. We really should keep it until that time is up, even though it may be costing them all kinds of money and, and hurting business prospects. Or perhaps uh, they have a year left on their legacy uh, virtualization enterprise licensing agreement, so they want to wait till that's up before they they venture into a, you know a, a cloud air type of, of native virtualization that's uh, you know no cost and it's more higher performing and more resilient and so on. And in the book, I refer to something called the agency dilemma, where where sometimes you know a minority of people may act in their self-interest rather than in the, the benefit of the overall organization. Uh, maybe a storage or virtualization administrator is, is very familiar with the technology and they're comfortable with it, and they, they really don't want to kind of upset the, the apple cart. And, and even you know the majority of, of administrators by far who are wanting to act in the organization's best interest, again, they, they can often be hampered by this three-tier lens um, type of, uh, of issue, uh, cognitive bias is another uh, term for it, um, uh, where they they just left to their own devices and not really understanding perhaps the nuances of the disruptive technology, they have a, a strong bias toward the status quo. When we do a financial analysis, we always strive to look at the business impact. It's not always possible, uh, but where it is, it can be very um, insightful. This is an example of a large healthcare organization, and because of their inability to see the storage associated with the individual virtual machines and their legacy three-tier environment, they were behind in opening new clinics. And when they realized with Nutanix, they, they would have perfect visibility into the storage, as well as the ability to automate and orchestrate through our API that they would be able to accelerate opening new clinics by three months and that would add to uh, seven that would in, increase revenues by 7.6 million over five years that was on top of uh, 10.6 million dollars in projected infrastructure savings in the book one of the constructs I use is a framework developed by the Greek philosopher Aristotle 2,500 years ago uh, in his treatise called Rhetoric, uh, The Art of Persuasion. And Aristotle talked about ethos, uh, uh, logos, and pathos. And so ethos really building credibility. The book talks a lot about the importance of building credibility, not just for the disruptive technology, but for the analysts. And and gives a lot of examples of how to do that. Uh, logos, the numbers, of course, the book is full of all kinds of examples uh, of different TCO and ROI analyses and, and how you compare uh, different solutions on, on a numerical basis. Uh, 
the uh, CEO of Nutanix, Dharaj Pandey, famously said, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, good enough isn't good enough. And, and we talk about that in the book. Uh, we also give a 10-step a process to follow when doing a TCO for public cloud, because so many people don't consider things like the little micro waste, the, the little services that uh, run in the background that you can't capitalize on in a public cloud, but it ends up costing you uh, a great deal of money. And pathos, uh, the importance of imbuing emotion into the into the numbers. How do you grab people from an emotional standpoint and get them vested to the point where you know they they agree with not only agree with the numbers, but but they're ready to act and they and 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 make that big move uh, to a disruptive infrastructure, or at least to start making the move uh, to disruptive infrastructure. And by the way, I should have introduced him earlier. Uh, the character you're seeing is ROI dude. He's the even more geeky uh, uh, alter ego of, of, of me. Uh, and uh, he gives tips throughout the book like this one, create a pain slide highlighting inefficiencies and so on. And anyway, so for those of you who uh, don't want to read the whole book, you can just uh, read the tips from ROI dude which are, are more entertaining. So keys to a successful financial analysis, besides, of course, wrapping a story around it, uh, adopt the, the mindset of a consultant, whether you work for a company uh, that's considering the, the technology or a manufacturer like Nutanix who's promoting it. Uh, we want to adopt a consultant's mindset. We, we don't want to do a black box type of TCO or ROI analysis and filled with marketing speak and delivered by a salesperson. Uh, we want it to be a very convincing document that will pass muster by the CFO and the, and the board. We want complete transparency. All the numbers and all the assumptions should be supported. They should be easy to follow. And where possible, again, we want to identify and, and even quantify business outcomes as at the end of the day, that's by far the most important benefit that uh, you can achieve from introducing a disruptive infrastructure solution. In conclusion, if you're a IT leader or a CIO, and on one side you have uh, the, the status quo huggers, the status quo defenders pushing that solution, and on the other side you have board of directors or, or other folks pushing a lift and shift to public cloud. Use a financial framework to make the best decision for your organization, which is typically going to be a, a multi-cloud strategy, but use a financial analysis to help determine what that strategy is and how it should look like. Uh, in short, uh, do the math. Great presentation, uh, Steve. Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions here for you. So the first one was, is there an ROI calculator that I can use myself for a self-service ROI calculation? Uh, yes, there is. If you go to the Nutanix website, Nutanix uh, forward slash TCO.com, uh, we have a, a TCO calculator there. We also have an ROI VDI calculator, keeping in mind that these are the type of analyses that, that I would say a lot of IT people have gotten frustrated with uh, because, you know, by design, they have to be very generic. Um, they, they have a lot of assumptions built in. They're very, very unlikely to be representative of your specific requirements. You know, all that being said, it at least gives you an idea, gives you a flavor of the type of benefits that you can accrue. Uh, but uh, I advocate doing a, a customized analysis to really understand the cost and benefits for your particular organization and use case. Okay, very nice. And then another question here, they're asking about, you know, is the only trigger, say, to migrate to hyperconvergence when I have, say, a greenfield deployment or my existing infrastructures, you know, like, coming off of lease and is, and is aging and needs to be replaced, or is it financially possible to make the move, you know, say in the middle uh, of a, a lease uh, situation? Yeah, great question. And, and the answer is uh, absolutely yes, it's possible because we're talking a lot more than just infrastructure here. 
in, in many cases, we're talking about an organization's future and, and even survival or, or, or thriving. Um, and if they're being inhibited by the three-tier infrastructure, by the status quo environment, then you know the the benefit from a financial analysis can be just extraordinary. In, in one case, uh, there was a, a large organization uh, that we we're working with, and by going to uh, a um, you know software-defined hyperconverged infrastructure, uh, they were able to facilitate an acquisition, uh, which then dramatically increased the market cap of the organization. And, and, and so it's it's capabilities like that 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 make an analysis so powerful. So absolutely, um, it's the business side that should be the, the primary driver, ideally. Uh, that being said, you know, if you do have infrastructure coming up for refresh um, or, or you're having to expand to a new use case or geography or whatever, uh, then yeah, analysis, that's a great time to, to do kind of an infrastructure focused analysis. Okay. Okay. Nice. And then another question here. Um, actually, this is one that just popped into my head. And that is, I mean, at one point I had a CFO that told me he didn't believe in any soft costs uh, being used in ROI calculations. So he, he would only respect hard dollar costs. Like, What's your take on that? And do you use soft dollar costs in your ROI calculations? Yeah. In the book, um, it includes a, a chapter, I call it the uh, accounting kind of, or finance 101, a review chapter on, on finance. We talk about the difference between soft cost and, and hard cost. And different people, of course, have different interpretations of what that really means. Some people, for example, will say, well, you know, we don't want to count staff savings because we're not going to fire anybody. Uh, so that's just a soft cost. But, you know, my feeling about that is that, that, for most IT organizations, their staffing is probably their, their number one expense. And, it, and you know, IDC, in another report they did, they, for, uh, they did for Nutanix, we paid for it, but it was independent. They showed that organizations moving from three-tier to Nutanix were able to slash administrative tasks by 61%. You know, that's massive, you know, because we're eliminating all the storage tasks. So if we do that, I look at it as a management problem now effectively using all this time that's freed up. And we've had customers do wonderful things. As an example, a large healthcare organization uh, was able to do, dramatically reduce their storage staff. They still had some storage left so they, they can um, free up everybody. But the people they did free up, they moved them over to start a new DevOps um, opportunity. Uh, for, for the organization, because the, the storage administrators tend to be very smart people, and and now instead of zoning switches and carving LUNs and managing raid groups and expanding volumes, you know, tasks that add zero value to the company, now they they can go into DevOps and and do things that will really make this massive difference for the organization, and that will be way more exciting for them and way more growth potential for them. Um, so, and I think that's true for a lot of hard and soft costs, and it's really up to the analyst, whether that analyst, again, it works for a channel partner or the company itself or manufacturer, it's really beholden on the analyst to to try and, and build the case to educate the customer that, uh, you know, that that these costs might be soft costs, but how will they, what is the importance of them to the business? Because in many cases, uh, the soft cost will be very important. Now, fortunately, uh, with Nutanix, what we see typically is, you know, the hard cost uh, alone justify moving to this disruptive solution. But but we also always like to put in the soft cost and and any stories around those soft costs because, like I said, it, it's it's oftentimes an emotional decision to give up 10 years or 15 years of status quo, and 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 we want to make sure we build as powerful a case as possible. And in the book, I kind of make it analogous to a producer putting on a play. Uh, you know, she has to get the right script and, uh, and, and it has to interview and, and get the best cast and, and the director and, 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 and the venue and the, and the stage set and the lighting and, and the choreography, you know, a thousand probably different decisions. But at the end of the day, if she's done everything perfectly, 
uh, you know, the audience stands up giving a uh, standing ovation. And with a good financial analysis, you know, assuming, of course, the numbers justify the disruptive solution, we want to wrap a story around it so at the end of the day, the decision makers uh, really have no choice but to stand up and uh, get galvanized on, on starting to move to this new direction. Excellent. Excellent. Let's see another question here. I mean, can you kind of walk me through the process that maybe you or one of your analysis uh, analysts would go through uh, in helping a company who maybe has an aging infrastructure or they're considering a move to the public cloud? Kind of what are the steps that you would go through to help them determine the ROI? Yeah, well, first of all, in the book, I address, there's a whole chapter about that. And, and we have many different uh, processes that we employ depending upon the type of situation is everything from a very quick 90 minute WebEx uh, or, or Zoom session uh, all the way up to an engagement that could take weeks or even months, uh, depending how, how deep we get. But, but for a standard simple one, We'll, we'll do a, a Zoom session, uh, 90 minutes, and, and we will have questionnaires that serve as guidelines. And we'll kind of walk the customer through those questions and using different techniques uh, outlined in the book if the customer, maybe they don't know how much money they would spend upgrading their legacy array. You know, but so we have ways that, that we can put in placeholders that will work well. Uh, and after we gather the information, we'll come back and we'll do uh, uh, an analysis iteration and then, uh, you know, kind of go back and forth with the customer or internal champion, whoever we're, we're working with until they're completely confident that the analysis makes sense, that they, they understand it so that they could go before the CFO or the board and say, you know, these numbers are real, they're conservative, we're going to be able to hit them. And, and the, the, it's true whether going against status quo or against public cloud, uh, we want to make sure and, and look at both sides or multiple sides, whatever we're evaluating, that we look at all the costs that are relevant to every scenario. Uh, for example, if it's comparing putting workloads on Nutanix versus public cloud, well, on the on-prem solution, we have uh, rack space, power, and cooling that we still have to pay for. You know, we want to include those costs just as we want to include connectivity to the public cloud. So we want to look at all the costs. We want to look at it over a multi-year time frame, five year is, is really ideal uh, from both an accounting and, and really uh, uh, just a, a logic perspective. Uh, and, uh, and and that way put together a very compelling, uh, uh, both, both a, a very revealing and a compelling document. Excellent, excellent. And Steve, let's see, here's another question. Um, why is your title customer success? What's, why is that important? So when Nutanix started the customer success organization, my team moved under it. And, and what we found is that for large enterprises especially, oftentimes they'll bring in Nutanix for a particular use case, and it runs really well and <laughs> seamlessly, which is very good, but it also has a negative uh, connotation in the sense that it, doesn't exp it does expand rapidly, but still not as fast as we like it to because – Many times IT is kind of burdened with all the things that aren't running well or all the projects they have to get up and going. Meantime, Nutanix is just running there seamlessly. So they don't give it the attention that uh, we think it deserves. And so really uh, one of the, 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 maybe the most important mission of customer success is to help organizations along this journey to enterprise cloud as a platform. And there are three primary pillars we use for that, uh, operational guidance, organizational guidance and financial guidance. And, and that's the, the primary mission of, of my team at Nutanix is to help uh, customers along this enterprise cloud uh, journey uh, to, uh, and, and um, do look back analyses to ensure that the customers are actually achieving the results that we projected, which by the way, uh, in the look backs we've done, they've been right on target. And, and as well as to help quantify new opportunities going forward, not just for the core Nutanix platform itself, but for all uh, our other supplemental capabilities like database, lifecycle management, and, and uh, automation. And um, 
software-defined networking through Nutanix Flow and, uh, and so on. Excellent, excellent. Well, it looks like that's all the live questions we have for today, but a really great presentation. Thank you so much for being on the event today, Steve. Thank you, David. Really great presentation there. Um, now it's time to announce our prize winner. The winner of today's $300 Amazon gift card is Kenneth Wilson of Massachusetts. Congratulations, Kenneth Wilson of Massachusetts. We'll reach out to you to deliver your $300 Amazon gift card. Uh, if you weren't selected as today's winner, no worries. We've got lots of other events coming up. Visit events.actualtechmedia.com to register for all of those events. And before you go, make sure you grab a copy of Steve's new book, The ROI Story, A Guide for IT Leaders. You can download that right there in the Handouts tab of your GoToWebinar control panel. It's a really great read. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it, especially if you're interested in calculating ROI for your IT organization. Thank you everyone who joined us on today's event. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Uh, we really appreciate it. And of course, visit Nutanix.com to learn more about the Nutanix Enterprise Cloud and calculating ROI and maximizing your IT investment. Thanks a lot and have a great day.